Well, good morning. Welcome to the Karis Daily Live Bible Study. My name is Daniel Bennett, and I'm your host for today. I am very excited about the message we have for you, uh, but I have a few things I want to touch on first. First of all, as a reminder, this, th these are interactive. If you're watching live, we really encourage you to, to interact by submitting your questions. You can go to the chat section of whatever format you're watching. So we encourage you to do that. Also, um, our schedule. So as you know, right now it's uh, 10 a.m. Mountain Time. And every Monday and Friday, we, we uh, are live 10 a.m. Mountain Time. Every Tuesday and Thursday, it's 6 p.m. And every Wednesday, it's 7 a.m. Again, all these are Mountain Time. And we have a wide variety, so people on different parts of the world um, can find a time that works for them. Um, obviously, you can watch these after the fact, but we want everyone to interact and ask, ask questions. So we encourage you to do that. If they're on topic, we're much more likely to get to them, but we'll get to as many as we can. Also, this is viewer supported, so I encourage you that if you feel like this is something you'd like to be part of, uh, you can sew into it, so you can um, go to the donate button, or you can also go to awmi.net slash give. Uh, you can also call our phone line and give over the phone. So our phone line is 719-635-1111. So 719-635-1111. Again, there's a wide variety of ways to give. You can also text the word give in any amount to 844-887-0796. So that's another way that you can do this by, by uh, texting. So also, if at any point afterwards or during this you'd like prayer, um, from getting born again or baptized in the Holy Spirit to just prayer of agreement about something. That same helpline is also our prayer line. So you can call 719-635-1111. So we, we encourage you to call that number. We'd be happy to minister um, with you and, and, and spend, spend some time with you if, if you'd like to reach out. And that is open 24 hours a day, five days a week. And on Saturdays and Sundays, we're also open uh, from 7.30 in the morning until 6 p.m. And again, these are Mountain Time. So now our guest speaker for today is Ricky Burge. I believe he shared uh, last week, so you may have heard him before already, but he's got an awesome, powerful word with, um, for you today. And so, uh, yeah, please uh, welcome Ricky. Thanks, Daniel. I appreciate that. <clears throat> welcome, everybody. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, <laughs> depending on where you are in the world right now. Um, I want to share about the subject of no longer I, so um, I'm taking this from Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, which we're going to read in a moment. But I'm basically going to talk about identity, that it's no longer I, but it's Christ. Or it's no longer Adam, but it's Christ. Like when you become a born again person, you don't just get a pass to go to heaven. You don't just even get like washed in the blood or a lot of these things that we say. And yet you still remain the same person or you still remain kind of subject to the same laws and rules and principles. But literally you become a new creation and all things become new in your life. And so the, the things in our lives that made us a failure or that made us sick or made us sinful or made us all of these different things that we want to uh, kind of overcome, the things that the, the root cause of those things, Jesus has taken to the cross. He took to the grave. And then when he rose up, we rose up and we are should be walking in newness of life. That's what the Lord wants for us. So, um, you know, the Lord just wants us to be free. He wants us to be free to be happy, free to, to have good relationships, free to be in love, free to have a purpose, free to not be afraid, free to walk in joy and peace. You know, that's what God wants for our lives. He, the, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you may have life and not just have it but have it in abundance, have it to the full, life at the highest level possible. And so that's what I kind of want to talk about today. You know, the gospel of Jesus Christ was intended to change the quality of our life. And so abundant life is not just like a quantity of life where, hey, one day you'll die, and you'll live forever. That's one thing. But the quality of our life is what the Lord wants to deal with us in the here and now. And so let's look at Isaiah chapter 55. I'm going to read verses 8 to 9. Um, it says, for my, this is the Lord speaking, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, or God's thoughts are not man's thoughts. God's ways are not man's ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than yours, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And so what God is saying is that whatever you think about yourself right now, whether you feel like you have a good opinion or bad opinion about yourself, whatever you think about yourself right now, God thinks so much higher of you then you think of yourself just like the heavens are so much higher than the earth. Mm -hmm. Like God has a high opinion of you. God thinks highly of you. Um, I was just sharing a while ago that um, in Psalms 139, it talks about how we are fearfully and wonderfully made. 
Did you know that that word fearfully in the Hebrew is the same Hebrew word we get the fear of the Lord from? Like all throughout the Old Testament when it says that the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord, that's the same scripture that God used when he says you are fearfully and wonderfully made. That means that God made you with a reverence, with a holy awe. He made you with respect and honor. You are reverentially created. And so God, only the creator can know the fullness of the creation. And so that's why he says, my thoughts, you just can't reach them. Even in Psalms 139, David said, man, it's too high for me. I cannot attain, like the perfect knowledge that God has of man, the perfect knowledge that God has of you. You, ha you just have to kind of forget what you think about yourself and just trust that what God says about you. Um, and so that's what I want to talk about today. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. It says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about the comparison of understanding that as a born again believer, as a child of God, now that you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, um, it is no longer you that you knew in the past, that you were when you were a child and you grew up with all of your life. Even if you got born again at 70 years old, that 70 year old person is no longer you, but now it's Christ. Mm -hmm. See, you are no longer Adam, you are now Christ. There's only two different races basically in the world. There's people who are in Adam and there's people who are in Christ. And so you are no longer in Adam, but you are now in Christ. You no longer derive your identity or your nature or your personhood from whatever you share with Adam. You don't share anything with Adam anymore. You now share everything with Christ. Christ is now the new and the last Adam. And so that's what I want to talk about today. Let's look at John chapter 1, verse 29. Uh, this is J uh, John the Baptist during a revival pointing out Jesus. Um, and the, the, it says, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, the word behold means a lot of things, but one of the definitions I love is that it means to learn by looking. Mm -hmm. You know, we are very visible creatures, right? We are image bearers. And so man doesn't have an image of his own. Mm -hmm. We are the image of someone else. We are the image of God. And so we were literally created to see and reflect, to see and imitate, to see and become. And so sometimes we can never actually become or take on the lifestyle of something that we haven't seen. That's why modeling things are so important in, in, in Christianity, because when people can see it, then they can understand it. When they see it, then they can be, kind of become it. And so um, what he says is, learn by looking. Behold the Lamb of God. Now, the word, the term Lamb of God was an Old Testament term, a sacrificial term. And every, all these Jewish guys knew what that meant. He, Behold the sacrifice of God. Behold the one who is not the temporary, but he's the full and final sacrifice to satisfy the wrath and justice of God. That's who he is. And he, what is he going to do? He's going to take away the sin of the world. Now, that word sin, hamartia in the Greek is a noun. It's not a verb. So he's not saying, behold the Lamb of God, who, the sacrifice of God, who's going to take away the actions of the world, the penalty of the world. Um, behold the Lamb of God who's going to take away the nature of the world, the character of the world, the, per the personhood of the world, the root, which is the source of the fruit. Jesus is not just dealing with the effect, but he's going to cut it. He's going to cut it at the cause. And so sometimes we do things in reverse, but God is not necessarily so much concerned with the effects in our lives. He's concerned with the cause of those things. And so behold the Lamb of God who's finally going to deal with the cause of the world. Mm -hmm. Why is the world this way? Why is the world full? Here's the Lamb of God who's going to deal with that. Mm -hmm. And so what we can see is that where does the world get its nature from? We get it from Adam. Mm -hmm. And so here's one thing that we don't understand is that it was kind of hereditary in a sense, you can say. Adam sinned, and he passed on that sin throughout his bloodline. Uh, like, I worked uh, for six years in Africa, and HIV was a big deal. And what we, th what we learned about HIV, I know they've got medications now, for, so, but uh, for a long period of time, and even now, people who can't afford medicine, if the woman has HIV and she's pregnant, she's going to pass that to her child. And the child didn't do anything to deserve the HIV. The child did not participate in any action to get the HIV. Just because of its relationship to the parents, it's going to have HIV. And it's going to come out sick. Mm -hmm. 
And so that's how we were. We didn't have, we didn't, we weren't there in the Garden of Eden, but because we were so connected to Adam, we came out with his HIV. We came out with his propensity to turn our, our back on God and go and destroy ourselves. Mm -hmm. Same thing with like people who like, um, you know, who, who do drugs, let's say crack. If a, if, a wife, if, a, if a woman is doing crack while she's pregnant with a child, the child is gonna come out, it's highly probable with the desire to smoke crack, to do that drug. The child did not participate in it. It had no um, involvement in the decisions of its mother, but it's coming out affected by the decisions of its mother to no fault of its own. Mm -hmm. And so it's the same thing when Adam and Eve turned their backs on the Lord um, and went out. So we came out with that same nature, that same propensity to go our own way, to have our own eyes and to build our own world without God. And so behold the Lamb of God who's going to take away that nature that we inherited from Adam. Mm -hmm. Everything that we inherited from Adam is now taken away in Christ. He's the one who can finally set us free who could break the umbilical cord between us and Adam and now reconnect the umbilical cord to us and him. And so let's look at some of how he does that. Let's talk about being born again. John chapter 3, verses 3 to 6. Uh, so, so Jesus answered Nicodemus, um, and he said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? But Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. In other words, he's not dealing with the physical birth. He's dealing with the spiritual birth, right? He's not saying to go back in your, that was the very problem. In your mother's womb, you were woven and shaping in iniquity. I don't want you to go back because you're just going to come out the same way you did. Mm -hmm. That which is flesh is flesh. But I'm dealing with, you must be born of the spirit. And she says, you must be born of water and the spirit. So I don't know if anyone has questions about this, but a lot of times in Africa, people will say, oh, born of water means baptism. But that's not what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. There's nowhere in John chapter 3 where Jesus mentions the word baptism. What he's saying is that you have to be a man, those who are born of water, right? When a woman is ready to give birth, her water breaks and a child comes out. We are born of water. Mm -hmm. Angels cannot be born again. Ad animals can't be born again. Only mankind can be born. Only those right. who come from Adam who are born of water can be born again. Mm -hmm. We are the only ones that qualify. Mm -hmm. And then he says to be born of the spirit. Um, now, Nicodemus, uh, let's continue at still in John chapter three, but verse nine to 10, Nicodemus answered and said to him, well, how can these things be? Like his mind is just blown. Now watch the, what Jesus answers him is very revealing. In verse 10, Jesus answered and said to him, are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like Jesus is appealing to him. You're a teacher of Israel. You know the Bible. Now, at this point, there was only the Old Testament. So who's the only person in the Old Testament who was born of the Spirit? Mm -hmm. It was Adam. The only person in the Old Testament mm -hmm. who was born of the Spirit was Adam. And so to be born again, what Jesus is saying is that which happened to Adam must also happen to you again. Now, let's look at it in Gen Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. We're going to compare this with John chapter 20, verse 21 to 22. And we're going to see what does it mean to actually be born again? All right, Genesis 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Mm -hmm. this, he's born of the Spirit. Right. The, the word breathe there in the Hebrew, it literally means to inflate. Like a tire, if you get a tire, that's... <laughs> So he's saying that he created a tire and inflated it with air. <laughs> or he created a body for man to live in, and then he inflated it. He breathed out of himself Adam. Adam was born of the spirit, right? And so God's spirit and Adam's spirit were one spirit initially. But when he said, on the day you eat of this tree, you shall surely die. Well, Adam didn't fall over and die and all this stuff. What happened? His spirit and God's spirit were disconnected. They were separated. And to me, from my study in scripture, I would say that that's literally what the sin nature is. It's man's spirit disconnected or separated from God's spirit, mm -hmm. right? It's man independent of God. It, right. it, because the, the word sin literally means to, it's a noun, it literally means to, um, to miss the mark. It means to be off target. So man fell short of God's glory, but in Hebrews 2, it talks about how Jesus came back to bring many sons to glory. And so man came off target, but Jesus came to put us back on target. Now, we see this in Genesis 2, verse 7. Now, let's compare it with John chapter 20, verses 21 to 22. So Jesus said to them, this is after he rose from the dead, um, after his crucifixion and after his resurrection. He's talking to his disciples and he says, peace to you. 
as the Father has sent me, I also send you. Verse 22. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. I mean, that's exactly what happened in Genesis 2, verse 7. Mm -hmm. That's what Jesus was saying, to be born again, to be born of the Spirit. That which happened to Adam must happen to you again. So the same one who breathed and inflated in Adam is the same one who breathes and inflates in us. Mm -hmm. You know, and when that happens, you become born again, born of the Spirit. And so what happens is this new birth comes with a new nature, with a new identity, comes with a new standing, a new relationship with God. Everything becomes new. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 16 to 17 says it this way. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. Verse 17. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. So in the beginning, when God breathed in Genesis 2, verse 7, Adam's spirit and God's spirit was one spirit. But when he, the day he ate of the tree, he died. What does that mean? God's spirit separated itself from Adam's spirit. And so when you get born again, John chapter 20 happens to you. God, whether you know it or not, whether you can feel the breath, that's not the point. The point is that God is right there close to you, waiting for you to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. And when you do, he... He breathes his spirit into you and you become a new creation. That which happened in the beginning to Adam happens to you again. And then that's you joining yourself to the Lord and becoming one spirit with God. Mm -hmm. And so a born again person is no longer your spirit and God's spirit are separated. But now you and him are one spirit. Yours, there's no difference between your born again spirit and God's Holy Spirit. It's one spirit. You are joined together to the Lord to the exclusion of anything else. And so you can never think of yourself independent of God because if you're born again, because he never leaves you, never forsakes you, you are always inter intimately connected to him at a heart level, at a spirit level. Mm -hmm. You cannot be separate. Like there's no space in between you and the Lord anymore. It's no longer I, but it's now Christ. Mm -hmm. And so um, 1 John 4, 17 says, love has been perfected among us in this. That we, have, uh, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. And so he says that love has been perfected. Love has reached completion. Love has reached its goal. And what was his goal? To give us boldness in the day that we stand before the Lord. We shouldn't be, Christians shouldn't be afraid of the, the day Jesus comes back or even afraid to die or anything like that. The, the love of God, its goal was to give us boldness, to mm. actually stand in the presence of God. Actually, the scripture says that um, come boldly before the throne of grace and he shall give you help in, in, in your time of need. Or help, he shall give you help and mercy in your time of need. And so we come boldly to the throne of grace. God wants Christians to be bold. The righteous are bold as lions. He doesn't want us to have our shoulders slumped and he doesn't want us to have our head down. He doesn't want us to feel like we're on the outside trying to work our way in. You know, um, I heard you say last night that there is a great connection between humility and boldness. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's true, like humility is not putting yourself down. Humility is not adding to or taking away from what God says about you. It's just accepting what God says about you. Humility is not putting yourself up or putting yourself down. It's just remaining right where God put you at. And so if God says, as he is, so are you, then humility says, as Jesus is, so am I. Amen. Humility says that he who be, he, if I believe in Jesus, I shall do the works he did, mm -hmm. and I will also do greater. Humility says, if I lay my hands on the sick, they'll recover. Mm -hmm. Humility says that I can speak life and raise the dead and call people back. Humility says that I can walk in dominion and authority and power. I can have love, joy, and peace. That's humility because that's what God died to give you and you're not adding to anything or taking away. That's literally what God wants for you. Mm -hmm. And so it, us being humble doesn't mean suffering through life. Us being humble doesn't mean, you know, going in a corner and trying to, you know, like... That's not humility. Boldness is actually a part of humility. And you've got to rec you've got to be sober about your life. You've got to recognize that God's thoughts are not your thoughts. God thinks so much highly of you. He, re he created you with reverence and honor and respect. And he adores you. He believes in you. You know, you're valuable. He will leave the 99 just to come and get you because there's never going to be another you. It doesn't matter about the 99. They can't replace the one because the one is irreplaceable. It's like... Mm -hmm. how, many would, how many of your children could you cash in for one of your? You just couldn't. Mm -hmm. There's no equivalent to it. It's like nothing can ever take the place of this one. 
there's going to leave a gap in God's heart forever until he gets that one back and then he can fill that gap in there. And so that's how God loves you and he want, you're in his house. You are in covenant with him. You're a part of his family. His nature's in you. And so you've got to start relating to the Lord like a child of God and not like a servant of God outside the house. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16 to 17, I want to talk about just like there's more to Jesus than what we saw, there's more to you than what we see or what you may see. Uh, verse 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I'm going to read verse 16 to 17. Uh, Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. He says, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Right? That's verse 16. He, so he's saying that, we knew Christ according to the flesh, according to, okay, his skin color, the way he, his clothes that he wore, the way he had his hair cut, you know, the shoes that he liked to wear. We knew Christ according to the flesh, but he says, now we don't know him any longer. Mm -hmm. And he says, in the same way, we also don't regard one another according to the flesh. Another way of saying this is that just as sure as there was more to Jesus than what we saw, there's literally more to each other than what we see. Just as sure as there was more to Jesus than what the average eye could behold, there is literally more to you than what the average eye can beheld. Verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, and old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. So let's skip to Matthew 17, and I just want to give us an example of, of this scripture, like of how there's more to Jesus than what we see and how there's more to us than what we see. Let's look at an example in Matthew chapter 17. Let me show you what I'm trying to communicate here. Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 to 2, it says this. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. He was, tra I don't know why it says, tra I look at transformed. Mm -hmm. And his face shone like the sun. Can you imagine that? And his clothes became as white as the light. That is amazing. I remember when I first read that in the Bible, it was like a, I saw a movie or something. <laughs> Can you imagine you went on a mountain, his face shone like the, the sun is extremely bright. How did he, I mean, does he have a button maybe <laughs> behind his knee that he hit the button and then he just, his body like transformed <laughs> and he showed him real, his true self and then he pressed the button and it wrapped it back up. I don't know, how did that happen? And then if we look at verse 9, it's in the same chapter. It says, now as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them saying, tell the vision to no one until the son of man is risen from the dead. Now that is, I just, that's a lot to take in. If you went on a mountain and it, it doesn't even talk about how Elijah and Moses and the voice came and said, this is my beloved son, hear ye him. We didn't even talk about that. Just just like a Jesus. He transformed in front of them, face shone like the sun, clothes light. I mean, and then he puts it back in. He says, don't tell anybody, Daniel. Keep, mm -hmm. it, keep it a secret, but just between us. If it was me, I would be, I would call Peter and James <laughs> or whoever, and I would sit by the fire at night and be like, what is that? Mm -hmm. What is, that's not a man. He's not like us. Do you remember what happened last night? What is that? Mm -hmm. Right, I would be so like interested in like, what is this? Like what manner of man is this? And then we have to keep it inside. We can't tell anybody about it. Like, so what he's saying is we knew Christ according to the flesh, but now we don't know him any longer. And so we don't, those who are in Christ, we don't know them according to the flesh either. Because just like there was something else in Jesus, there's also something else in us. When we become joined to the Lord, we become one spirit with him. That same stuff that was in Jesus is now in us. Mm -hmm. And maybe you don't have a button to like open it up and put it back in, but it's in there. Right. It's, power, it's powerful. Just that image of imagine going to the Mount of Transfiguration and seeing yourself glowing like that, shining bright like the sun and realizing like because of Christ, that's, that's, uh, that much is in me also. It's just our eyes can't see it all the time. Bro, just as sure as there was more to Jesus than mm -hmm. what we saw. There's more to me and you and mm -hmm. me and you than what we see. We've got that same stuff in us. Mm -hmm. We've got that same stuff in us. Like um, there's a treasure in this earthen vessel. Second Corinthians 4 verse 7 says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the ex excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. That's what he's saying. You know, in the Old Testament, like we talked about how we are the New Testament temple of God. Mm -hmm. And in the Old Testament, it was a literal building, you know, with the Holy of Holies and everything. 
Now, in the New Testament, the body says, the, the scripture says, our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And so, um, when you look at the Old Testament type and shadow of the new reality, you'll see that on the outside of the Old Testament tabernacle, it was badger skin. And I don't know if you've ever went to a high-end store, like, hey, can I get a badger skin coat? You got some badger skin boots? No. <laughs> People get, like, chinchillas. They get, like, lamb's wool or... You know, all of this expensive, exotic, beautiful looking stuff. Nobody wants a badger coat, you know? Mm -hmm, right. But on, so on the outside, the temple looked ugly. It looked like badger skin. But on the inside, it was the presence of God. It was gold and really the good. Ark of the Covenant and all this expensive stuff. It's, you know, the Aaron's rod that budded and the, the, taber, the, two, the Ten Commandments and all of this expensive, invaluable stuff inside of badger skin. Mm -hmm. So somebody, if a, if, a, if a warrior tribe came over there and they looked at it, they'd say, oh, there's nothing inside it. That's just, look at that old dusty, raggedy house. And we don't want it. It can't be anything good in there. They didn't know everything that was good was in there. Mm -hmm. Same thing with me and you. We may look at ourselves and see badger skin. We may look at ourselves and see, man, I'm nothing. I'm just raggedy. I've been poor all my life. I come mm -hmm. from nothing. I'm the least of the least of the least. But you, God's thoughts are not your thoughts. Mm -hmm. Man, the way he thinks about you is so much higher than the heaven is higher than the earth. You were made with reverence and respect and honor. There's a treasure inside of that badger skin. Mm -hmm. What kind of treasure? The same treasure where Jesus revealed and in his face shone like the sun. That's inside of you right now. Mm -hmm. And I just hope that you can understand that. There's so much more to you than what you feel. There's so much more to you than what you've experienced. There's so much more to you than what other people say about you. There's so much more to you than what you could even think or imagine. And so you've got to plug into your relationship with the Lord so that he can show you what he sees about you. You know, there's a scripture in Psalms 32 that says, I will teach you and instruct you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. And I compare that with um, Genesis 3 where it says that when they ate of the tree, it says that their eyes were open, then they knew they were naked. Mm -hmm. See, the tree of the knowledge and good and evil is basically having your own eyes. See, before that, they didn't have their own eyes. They saw everything through the eyes of God. Right. But when they got their own eyes independent of God, now they determine whether what's good or evil. They had been naked the whole time and nothing was wrong. But now it's wrong because you got your own eyes and you say it's wrong. But God doesn't say it's wrong. Mm -hmm. You see that? And so we've got to stop having our own eyes, basing, judging ourselves based on what we deem to be good and evil. And we've got to get into the word of God, into the scriptures, and we've got to see ourselves through God's eyes. And so I'm just going to... Um, uh, I'm going to finish up here in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And I'm going to read from verse 12 to 18. And I just want to talk about how the veil is taken away in Christ. Now it picks up at verse 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12. It says, Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. There's that word boldness again. Mm -hmm. Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not steadily, steadily look at the end of what was passing away. So right here, Paul is comparing the old covenant Moses to the new covenant believer. In Moses, people look at him, and literally the law is called the law of Moses. It was the covenant of Moses. I mean, Moses said, There's gonna, God's going to raise up a prophet who shall be like me. I mean, Moses is a big deal, right? Mm -hmm. When Elijah appeared with Jesus on the mountain, Moses was there as well, representing the law, and Elijah representing the prophets. Moses is a big deal. But he says Mo Moses could not have the same boldness of speech that we have. He had to put a veil. He, he did not have the audacity that we could have. Mm -hmm. He would never think <laughs> what Paul's about to say. Moses would never even think to put himself in that same category or conversation. We've got such a stronger boldness than Moses could ever have. Okay, verse 13, unlike Moses who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look, at, look steadily at the end of what was passing away, but their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. Remember what we talked about, that being born again, the, being born again means that um, you become one again with the Lord. His spirit and your spirit become one spirit now. And so that means that he has taken the nature of Adam away from you and he has infused his nature in you. The veil is taken away in Christ. What, what happened was is that Moses went on the mountain for 40 days, 40 nights. He didn't eat. He didn't drink anything. And when he came down, his face was shining just like Jesus. Mm -hmm. His face was shining. It was radiating. He had the residue of God's glory on him. But it says that Moses did not have the boldness to think that that residue of glory wouldn't pass away. He knew that it was temporary. 
And he put a veil so that the people couldn't look at what was passing away. But it says that for us, our veil is taken away in Christ, which means that when we see that glory of God and that glory of God infuses within us, it's not a temporary glory that will pass away. It's an eternal, permanent glory. The veil is taken. When you get born again, the veil is taken away in Christ. When mm -hmm. you are in Christ, that veil is taken away because your nature accurately reflects the nature of God now. Mm -hmm. And so now the glory that comes on you, it doesn't have to pass away because it doesn't find a home. That glory can actually rest upon you because you accurately reflect the image of God now. Mm -hmm. And so verse 15 says, but even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, again, you can say when one get born, gets born again, when your spirit and God's spirit becomes one spirit, um, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, there is freedom. But we all with an unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord. We are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Just as by the Spirit of the Lord. You have to be born of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. When you are born of the Spirit, when your Spirit and God's Spirit become one, when that which happened to Adam happens to you again, then the veil is taken away. So as you behold the glory of the Lord, there's nothing covering your face. There's nothing saying that, what you see, what, what's on the, like there's something on the other side of the veil, but you can't get to it because there's, su there's separation there. There's inaccuracy there. That was true for Moses because he was not born again. He lived before Christ. Mm -hmm. He lived before Jesus was able to die for sin, raise from the dead, and breathe life into man once again. So Moses was operating at the highest level in his covenant. Mm -hmm. But we have a better covenant established on better promises. And so that means that we don't, we, we don't have a veil in between us and the Lord now. We are true children of God. And so that means that when me and you look into the glory of God, which is Jesus, the mm -hmm. scripture says in Hebrews chapter 1, that Jesus is the brightness of God's glory and the express image of his person. So when I look into Jesus, who is the manifest glory of God, he's the visible image of the invisible God. He, no man has seen God at any time. But the son who was in the bosom of the father has declared him. He has, Jesus has, Jesus is the word of God. God put his heart, his nature, his character inside of a human body so that we can behold and learn by looking. As I behold Jesus, I now behold my true self. It is no longer I, but it is now Christ. So I can't look into Adam as my mirror. I have to look into Jesus as my mirror. There is no more accurate depiction of who you are as a born again person than the life of Jesus. As he is, so are you right now. The veil is taken away. You literally can look into him with nothing covering your face. When you see him, you are literally seeing yourself. And God is transforming you into that very same image from glory to glory to glory to glory. It's by the spirit of God in you. Mm -hmm. Now our born again spirits are already sealed, recreated and sealed, but we are being transformed in our heart. Well, half of our heart, which is our heart is our spirit and our soul. Our, our spirit's already taken care of. You know, our spirit and God's spirit are one. But it's our soul that has the biggest challenge. Mm -hmm. It's our soul. It's the way we think. It's the way we believe. It's our imagination. It's our belief system. It's our ideas and concepts. You know, we, we've, we, we've been programmed with Adam. We've got to delete that program, and we've got to upgrade ourselves to Jesus' program. You know, some people want to change their life, but they don't want to change the way they think. Mm -hmm. They want to change their life, but they don't want to change what they believe. And God is saying, if you want to update your life, you've got to first update your mind. Mm -hmm. You've got to first update the way you think and believe and imagine. And, and your, your, all of that stuff in you has to be updated. It's got the old stuff has to be deleted. Old things have passed away and all things have to become new. You know, the scripture in Romans 12 that we quote a lot here in this ministry is that um, Paul said, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And then he says that and you'll be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Mm -hmm. That word renewing literally means to renovate. Mm -hmm. It means I go into a house and I redecorate, I, I, I gut out the walls, I, I take out all the cabinets, I remove all the rugs, I take all the pictures off, all the furniture, everything has to go. Everything has to go. And then I come in and I renovate it. I bring in, 
I take out the old and I bring in new paint and new pictures and new furniture and new pots and pans and new everything has to be new. Now on the outside of the house, it may still look like the same house. Mm -hmm. It may still look like badger skin, but mm -hmm. on the inside of the house, oh, it's a brand new house, right? Mm -hmm. Because it, I've renovated it. And that's what the Lord is saying to us is that if you want to see transformation in your life, you've got to renovate your mind. You, you've literally got to be honest with yourself and say, you know what? The way I think, the way I believe, all of this stuff I inherited from Adam, I've got to get rid of that. Like, not spiritually, it's already happened, but mentally you've got to get rid of it. Those old memories, those old habits, those old imaginations that you carry with you, you've got to get rid of that stuff, delete that program, and update your mind. And when you do, you will literally automatically and effortlessly update your life. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's kind of what I wanted to share today, Daniel. Yeah, well, amen. Yeah, it's powerful. And, uh, yeah, we have a lot of good questions, so I'll get to as many as we can. Okay. Um, so this first one from Mandy on chat. She's asking, even though I've been a Christian my entire life and know the word, I struggle with a constant mindset of inferiority. What am I missing? Why can't I see myself the way God sees me or believe he is pleased with me? Yeah, well, you know, James chapter 1 talks about whoever looks in the perfect law of liberty is like a man beholding himself in the mirror. Um, man, could you pull that scripture up? I don't, I, I don't want to misquote it. See, I don't think I can hear. But, but you look in the perfect law of liberty, it's like a man beholding himself in the mirror. Mm -hmm. And um, it says, basically, the word of God is a mirror. It shows you who you are, right? And so you've got to basically look into the word of God, and you've got to behold, and you've got to keep looking until, okay, James chapter 1, verse 25. It says, but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but he is a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. So he's not a forgetful hearer, but he's a doer of the work. He looks in the perfect law. Of, uh, can we read verse 24, I think? Yeah, if it, oh, this is 26, verse 24. Yeah, for he observes himself. Let's start at verse 23. We'll go to verse 25. I'm sorry, man. <laughs> So James chapter 1, we're going to read from verse 23 to verse 25. So it says, verse 23, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer. So in other words, I keep hearing, right? I keep hearing all this stuff, but I can't do it. Mm -hmm. I'm struggling to act on what I hear. I've heard God loves me. I heard God forgives me. I heard that I'm the head and not the tail, but I still can't do it. I'm doing inferiority. There's a con contradiction there. So he says, if anyone's a hearer, but he can't do what he hears, he's like a man observing his natural face in the mirror. Verse 24, for he observes himself, right? When you look in the word, you see yourself, but then you go away and you immediately forget what kind of man you are. Mm -hmm. And verse 25 says, but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and he continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer, this one will be blessed in what he does. So what I get from that is that I've got to have a healthy relationship with the Word of God, right, where the, the image that I get on the pages become imprinted on my heart. Mm -hmm. So I've got to stay looking in the mirror until what I see in the mirror becomes what I see in my heart. So that, because I can't walk around with the Bible every day, all day, but what I can do is I can make sure that I get time to stare in the mirror long enough so that when I leave the mirror and I go and live my life, I don't forget what I saw. Mm -hmm. And that's what God is saying, that once the mirror, once the image in the scriptures become the image in your heart, then you won't just be a hearer, but you'll be a doer. Mm -hmm. It'll start to work in your life because the image isn't just in the Bible that you closed and left at home, but that image came out of the Bible and, and came on your heart. Amen. Amen. Um, next question by Hannah on YouTube. Is it humble to say that we are like God? Because it kind of sounds like what the enemy said, that he would make himself like God. Um, actually, um, the... the Adam and Eve were more like God before they ate of the tree than after they ate of the tree. Mm -hmm. They actually didn't become like God, right? He lied to them. Mm -hmm. So, but what God said is in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, 6, he says, let us make man in our image and in our likeness, and then let him have dominion. You are like God. Mm -hmm. See, here's the thing. Everything reproduces after its own kind. Mm -hmm. Fish reproduce fish, birds reproduce birds, right? And so when God reproduced you, he did it according to his own kind. He breathed you out of himself and put you in a body. You are of God's kind. Mm -hmm. And even when you get born again, in 1 Peter chapter 1, it says that we are born of the incorruptible seed of the word of God, which lives and abides forever. God puts his seed, his word into your heart and creates a new person. You are born of God. Mm -hmm. 
And so it's no, and even in um, is it Acts chapter 17, there's a scripture that says, for we are his offspring. Mm -hmm. I mean, on and on we can go. You have to accept that you are a child of God, made in his image, made in his likeness, and you are of his kind. Mm -hmm. You know, when God spoke to, when you look at creation and you see how God, um, for example, like the, the, the fish of the sea, he spoke to the water and he said, let the waters bring forth the, the, the fish of the sea and stuff. Mm -hmm. When he created the, the animals on dry land, he said, let, he spoke to the dry land and said, hey, let the dry land bring forth all the creatures that shall be on. But when he created us, he didn't speak to the water or the dry land. He spoke to himself. Mm -hmm. We come from God. Mm -hmm. The animals come from the earth. The, the, the animals in the water come from the water. But we, me and you, we come from God. Mm -hmm. And so, no, it's not wrong to say that you are like God. It's wrong to say that you are God. Right. You aren't God, mm -hmm. but you are his child. You come right. from him. Yeah, yeah, there's a difference between saying, I am God the Father, versus saying, no, I am, he is my Father. Exactly. It, it's very different. That's yeah, he says, God is God. He says, we're going to have some children in our image and likeness so they mm -hmm. can be compatible with us, come into our relationship and not feel like they don't belong, but they're not us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. So in that with us, I mean, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. you know, there's one God. So the next one, um, John on YouTube is asking, how should we regard those who we care about, but who are not yet Christians? How should we regard those we care about? Right. So, so how should we think about them and interact with them if, if this doesn't apply to them yet? Well, the scripture says God so loved the world mm -hmm. that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes will not perish but have eternal life. Scripture says that Christ died for, God, the Lord demonstrated his love for us and that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. And so God has, still has, man has in, innate value. Just be, you don't get valuable because you get born again. You were already valuable. He didn't die mm -hmm. for you once you were born again. He died for you before right. with the hope, the joy before him is what it helped him endure the cross, right? The joy of the Lord gave, the joy gave him strength to endure the cross. Mm -hmm. And what was that joy? It was him seeing us in that completed work. But he didn't die for the completed work. He died for the uncompleted work, mm -hmm. knowing that this is the first step to get to the completed work. Mm -hmm. And so we have to see people as God sees them, meaning he already sees them kind of completed already, but we're gonna have to endure some suffering in their lives, discipleship, evangelism, all of that stuff, until Paul says it in Galatians 4, he says, my little children whom I labor to, in, in, in birthing pains until Christ is formed in you. And so what we do is we, we, we can see what they don't see about themselves. And just like God saw what we didn't see about ourselves. And mm -hmm. so to me, I don't think you disregard unbelievers until they get born again. I think you, you should, there's joy in heaven when just one sinner repents. Like God is, and here's what I would say. I would say, Daniel, if I had a dollar and you had a dollar, and let's say my dollar was, was torn up, it had tape on it, it had been through all these hands, it's dirty, it's, uh, you can barely see the image of the president on it. I mean, it's just, and then you come with your fresh dollar from the <laughs> bank, right? If me and you go to the grocery store and buy some chips or whatever, I can still spend that dollar. It has the same value that mm -hmm. your dollar has. Mm -hmm. Now yours is in good condition, mine is in bad condition, but the value is the same. Yeah. And that's, that's how good. God looks at us, man. Yeah, somebody may be dirty and worn down and beat up, but they still have the same value yeah. that you have, you know? So yeah. let's be a part of God's redemptive purpose for their life. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, Alyssa on YouTube is asking, so switching from unbelievers, um, how should we look at our born again brothers and sisters who are unrepentant for their unrighteous actions and continue to practice ungodly things? Yeah, that's tough. And I don't have a lot of time to share with that. That is tough. But there's a lot of scriptures that talk about it. Matthew 18 talks about it. Galatians 6 talks about it. Paul says, brethren, if you see someone overtake, if you see your brother overtaken in the fault, let he who is spiritual restore such a one, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. And so, first of all, it says, if you're going to, the, the approach we should take is restoration, number one. And the only people who are mature enough to take that approach, approach are people who are spiritual. Mm -hmm. And so, you also have to consider yourself, lest you also be tempted. And so, we should always be looking to restore um, our brothers and sisters. Now, if someone refuses to be restored, then you can't, you can't override their free will. Mm -hmm. So, you can only work with someone as they're willing to work with you. And what I've learned is you have to move at the speed of the person who's tr who's, who needs restoration and not at your speed who wants them to be restored so quickly. Mm -hmm. Take your time, be patient, and move at their speed and just pray for God to protect them and cover them until the time that they come like the prodigal son back home. Amen. 
And well, we're about to wrap up, but uh, I'll ask you, would you mind praying for everybody? And, and I'd say specifically for those who, who want to see themselves more um, like God sees them and who, are, who may be struggling with this. Father, we just thank you for <clears throat> your truth that makes us free from all the lies that we've been told, the lies we grew up with, the lies we've believed, um, the lies that are waiting for us tomorrow. Satan just doesn't give up. He's, he, he's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But I thank you that your truth causes us to be men and women of God who cannot be devoured. And Lord, I just thank you that um, you begin to impress us with your word and that you begin to paint, you begin to delete and erase the ungodly pictures that we may have of ourselves and images that we may have of ourselves. And that as we go through your word, you begin to draw a new picture, write a new picture on our hearts, that we may have an accurate image inwardly on our hearts of how you see us, Lord. Help us to see through your eyes. Help us to access your thoughts, Lord. And Lord, I just, I just re rebuke all of the, the contradiction that the enemy comes when your word goes forth into our hearts, but that we shall not be distracted by it, but we shall hold on to your word. We shall apprehend that for which we have been apprehended, Father. I just thank you for giving us the energy and the grace to pursue you um, until we, we, we come to a place of rest and we come to a place where that's it. I know that I know that I know that God loves me. I know that I'm new. I know that I'm changed. I know that I'm a new person. And so I just thank you that your, that, that faith will come by hearing and hearing and hearing your words. And so we give us an ear to hear what you're saying to our hearts. And we just thank you that um, there's just good things waiting for us on the other side of this process. And thank you for starting the good thing and thank you for finishing the good thing in Jesus name, amen. Amen, well, thank you so much, Ricky. I know that's, um, that, that's ministered to you and this has been an awesome time. We just pray that you guys have an awesome weekend and keep, keep meditating on this, think about this and really absorb it. So have an awesome weekend and we'll see you on Monday. Thanks, Daniel. Mm -hmm. Bless you.